I'm going to show you a little bit about how I make a living with my camera, and I shoot um, nautical imagery, be it coastal, lighthouses, boats, ships, and um, I'll just sort of, and, and I encourage questions. If you have a question, please just give me a shout. We've got a nice small group, so we can spend some time chatting. Um, and even the most simple question, there's an, I don't ever think there's a stupid question, so um, fire away. Um, I started off, everybody can see from there, I started off as a professional sailor, and I did the Whitbread Around the World race, uh, which is now called the Volvo race. And so it's a race that goes around the world, um, and it has three stops. And I went on board as a crew member and then started shooting along the way, and that sort of was really the start to my, my photo career. Um, this was done with film. Uh, this was still on Kodachrome. Uh, this was 1981. And um, because I was working on the boat, I'd go up the mast to check the rigging. And um, it was just a, a unique spot to be, obviously a little hairy, but exciting. Um, I, I do a lot of onboard stuff here. It's always one hand for the boat and one hand for the camera. And uh, what's that? Harness. No harness. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's not like I'm in the middle of the ocean there. You know, this was in some coastal water. But, you know, if you've got to put a harness on, I mean, goodness, it'll take me forever to get out there and tie it back on. And, um, this is another assignment that I did way down south um, near Antarctica. Um, I spent five weeks on the boat documenting the whole, the whole travel and the whole trip. I do a lot of aerial work. Uh, I love helicopter work. It's such a unique um, perspective. Have any of you shot from a helicopter before? No, it's especially the smaller R44 is uh, is not that, that ridiculously expensive. Sometimes you can book them for half an hour. Cost you $250, $300. Um, and the imagery you'll get from the air is quite unique, quite different. Um, I jump in the water quite a bit. I, I use waterproof housings that uh, Aquatech makes. And um, I put a regular DSLR. Um, I'm waiting for the new 1DX housing to come out. But this was done with a 5D Mark II. And then I have a power boat that I use. Uh, the, this is my wheels on the water, uh, a great 25-foot inflatable, um, a fun piece of gear. I'm going to stand on this side a little bit and sort of, yeah, this is better. And so, of course, wheels on the water for me are everything. I, you know, you can't get on the water. Sorry, Mr. Cameraman, I'm moving around, giving you a moving target. <laughs> um, you know, you have to have a good boat, and I have a trailer for it, so if the job's in Maine or it's in New York, I just hook it up to the Suburban and we go. And I have a driver. This happens to be my youngest boy, who is 13, and he has really learned nicely. The older kids don't really care much anymore. They're off doing their own thing. This gives you a little idea of, for those of you that haven't shot from a, a, a little a moving powerboat before, I mean, this gives you a little idea of what it's like. It's pretty bumpy. It can be quite wet. This is a 300 that I'm hand-holding, and I shoot with a 500 as well. Do you lose your balance? Do I lose my balance? Very rarely. I've never fallen off the boat. Let's put it that way. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. This was the start of the Newport Bermuda race. Uh, this past summer. Uh, it's a major ocean race, 600 miles, and um, a lot of interesting boats and people. Um, I do shipping as well. So for me, shipping is interesting because it doesn't have the beautiful, shiny white boats and the, and the colorful spinnakers. And um, it, it's, it's, it's nice to do something different. You know, I wouldn't want to do shipping all the time, but it sure is nice to do it from time to time. Um, this was a, a ship down in Western Australia. And I had to fly down there and, and document the ship for the company that owns the ship. And they use it for marketing. So she's a, a, an, an iron ore carrier. Welcome. And this is all about big. I mean, it's large. It's, it's great. I love the scale. I always try and put people in there. This was in a shipyard in Korea, actually in Singapore, uh, where I was doing another project. And I just walked around while we were waiting for our ship to leave. And, um, Gives you a little idea on scale. Talking about size, these are the shackles that the boys use. You know, it's a little different to a sailboat. I take it you're a sailor, right? Yeah. yeah. What size boat do you sail on? A lot of different ones. Oh, this cool. This particular one's J80, but okay. uh, a lot of bigger boats. Nice. So you can relate to shackles. <laughs> Don't drop that on the point. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, so some, one of the shipping companies I work for is a Dutch company called Dockwise. And they move oil rigs around the world. And um, 
it's, it's an interesting business to shoot because they don't wait. If the weather's bad, that's the way it is. If it's dark, you've got to figure out how you shoot it. You can't say, hold on, wait for me. You know, we need some sunshine here. So, um, so this gives you an idea of, 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 the, of the size and um, scale. There's a guy walking down there. This is looking through the legs of the rig on the deck <coughs> of the ship. And so um, this was obviously taken with a helicopter in the Gulf. And uh, it gives you a, a scale. And this ship sinks down to discharge. So now she's sunk down. So I'll go back to the previous picture. If you take a, a reference on the name Blue Marlin, and you can see how high the name is here. And then they, they what they call ballast the ship with salt water, sink her down, and then the tugs come in and tow it off. So my job is to document the whole thing. And I do it with stills and with video. And then I have an assistant, and we run five cameras. We do time lapse, stills, video, sometimes GoPro, uh, the whole nine yards. It's a very, f very busy, hectic time for us. Um, and then when the job is done, here the deck is clean, the, sh the, the, the oil rig is gone, the helicopter comes in to pick us up, and we fly back to uh, wherever we needed to head off to. This is a, a sister company that transports sailboats. So if you have a yacht that's in, in wherever on the East Coast and you want to head to the Caribbean for the winter, you call these guys up, they sink their ship down. Let's go to the next shot here. So this gives you an idea of how it works. Dry deck, getting all the blocks ready. The next one, they submerge the ship down and then all the sailboats and the powerboats come in. And again, I do all their marketing work for them, their ads, their videos, and they work all over the world, so I'm always traveling for them. So here we are sunk down, the divers down below, um, preparing the stands. And my job is to get in the water and photograph how the whole operation works. And again, I've done it with video and with still. Here I've used a 5D Mark II in an Aquatech housing with a 15 millimeter lens. So, and then I switch off the autofocus so that I just set it for at, at about sort of five feet. But because I'm using a 15 millimeter lens at f18, I mean, everything's sharp all the time. So uh, that's why you get that nice little ridge of where the water line meets the camera. You can see the guys up top, and we've got tons of depth of field. It's always challenging with this because up top it's very bright, down low it's quite dark. And so um, in Lightroom, I'm able to mask off the top a little bit. But obviously, you've got to keep some, some information in the file up top. You can't blow everything out. So you know, I, I work with my histogram, and I work with the little blinkies on the camera that when it shows, when it overexposes. So I'm in the water. I'm like, ah, hold on. And I go down again and do my, my shot. Here at night, now the deck is dry. They're going to weld all the stands and get everything settled. Um, and then the next day the ship sails. But this is obviously a work through the night and you've got to go and figure out how to do your lighting. But with all the welding going on, it was like I was using a nice filter. So here's how they use my photography. This is coming out of Martinique down in the, in the Caribbean. This is a, uh, a small powerboat company called Hunt. They build their boats in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. I do advertising for them. And these are great projects. I love doing this because I pick the models, I pick the location, I pick the weather. Basically, the client comes to me, and most of them work without ad agencies. It's always one marketing person who sometimes even helps painting the boats and whatever. So I've got to explain to them how it all works. And they'll say, well, how much is it? And I give them an estimate, and I put the whole thing together. So I produce the whole ad. And it's, it's great because I'm able to pick the good looking people and the location and the weather and make sure that what they get is, is a good product. Same thing, powerboat company, the models, nice late light. I'm shooting this with probably a 24 to 105, the IS version of that. And here I'm shooting at about a 15th of a second handheld. So nice and slow to get the blur. And here's the ad, same photo shoot, little different angle. I love using slow shutter speeds. I think it's so effective. And you know, if you practice a lot, be it you know, with the waves at the beach or whatever, you will figure out what you can handhold and at what point you've got to use a tripod. But obviously, using a helicopter or a motorboat, tripods aren't an option for me. So I've got to sort of figure out at what point I can get a nice crisp shot and still have the water silky. And I must say that probably half my shots are not sharp because I'm right on the edge with such a slow shutter speed. Um, 
with a gyro, do I ever use a gyro stabilizer? I, I don't for still, for video I do. Um, I just find that the lenses have enough image stabilizing in them, and I know the parameters, and I've learned to work with it. Uh, I find that if you start working with a gyro stabilizer, it all becomes so heavy and so much battery power and right. more stuff to lug on the plane, and you know, it's just, yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, the new generation Canon lenses now, um, they have such good image stabilizing. I just got a new 500 the other day, their Mark II, the new version. Mm -hmm. And I had the older version, and I could not believe how much better the image stabilizing is in the newer lenses. So, yeah, it's, it's, people often say, is it worth me buying the 70 to 200 with IS or without? And I'm like, it, it's just, I know it's l more money, but the difference is night and day. Yes? Yes. Uh, the water is silky. Right. And yet, the beyond the, the waves, the ripples in the water seem fairly sharp. Right. How did you? Uh, and you fly with a slow enough shutter speed. Why isn't everything silky? Yes. Because it's a wide-angle lens, and the further away the subject is beyond the boat and the land the less it's moving in relation to me in the helicopter. So if I'm working with a boat moving along like this, the background is actually not moving a lot. And so if I used a longer lens and got in, you know, further away and just cropped, then it would all be silky, like this shot here, there. Okay, so there we're all shooting in one plane, but with this one, it, it starts to get sharper and sharper as the subject moves less. So. Yeah, and that's just a quality of the wide-angle lens. And this was a job that the, the, the builder said to me, would you go shoot the boat and we need to sell this thing. It was actually a brokerage type deal, a used boat. And uh, this was in Rhode Island on Narragansett Bay. And um, in my power boat, he didn't want to do a helicopter. I said, fine, that's OK, we can deal. And uh, nice late light. Um, this is the interior. And here's where I use my lights. I, I, I'm going to start using these LEDs to try and get some interesting lighting in there. I use my lighting very subtly. Obviously, the boat has beautiful halogens, but I like to supplement it with some extra lighting. How much is the boat? Sorry? How much is the boat? A boat like this is about three, four, five million dollars. Yeah. And most of these people have a home in Aspen and probably, uh, you know, so it's an apartment in Manhattan. So. <laughs> Um, here's another slow shutter speed, you know, where I put it on a tripod and I do probably five, six, seven seconds. And what you get, this boat is at anchor, but because it's moving like this in the current, you get this movement. Again, the nice blur and the silkiness. Um, but obviously the, the, the background and, you know, that's soft, but the interior of the boat is nice and sharp. And the whole secret about getting this correctly lit is to wait until the ambient light starts to drop down, down and it comes to a point where the interior of the boat and the exterior are about the same value. And you probably only have about 15 minutes or 10 minutes of that. And then the outside goes too dark and then you lose it. And I do the same technique for shooting lighthouses uh, or on the beach, some nice lighting. I, I go and people will say to me, oh, it's too dark. What are you trying to do? But when you leave it open, as you guys know, the light comes back in again. And it's a wonderful way to shoot this type of imagery. And he has a little shot of the drinks that everybody loves. And they use them in the brochure. And it's like, come aboard. We're ready for you, you know, so. James Bond. James Bond. Yeah, exactly. And here's how they use the images. And so we, now I'm going to show you a little bit more of the action stuff. This is in the Bahamas. Um, a regatta they do in Georgetown. And uh, this particular event, I went down on my own nickel because I heard it was really exciting shooting and beautiful colors and um, went down. Close action here with a 300. I did have the 500 as well. Here I cropped quite a bit into the shot. This was taken, you know, working down in the islands is always a challenge because you don't always get the boat that's working or the guy doesn't show up. And so here the outboard wasn't working. So I went up to the roof of the hotel and shot with my 500 and actually got some very nice imagery out of it, which was, you always have to be a little creative down there and not think it's the end of the world. You know, you have to sort of, here I'm in the water, um, guys coming around the mark. And this was sort of an interesting story. I, 
I asked beforehand, do you think they'll give me permission to jump in the water? And everybody said, ooh, I don't think so. So I thought, well, I'm not going to ask. I'm just going to do it. And uh, my chase boat driver had no idea that I had this plan going on, because I said, go to the top mark. And I just jumped in, and he started screaming. I said, move away a little bit. And I had timed it that when the boats were coming up to the top mark, that there wasn't enough time for the police boat to come and grab me. <laughs> so the police boat wouldn't get in the way. And so I, I just knew I had to do some pretty fast talking after the boats had rounded. But I got my pictures, and I had to apologize to everybody. And, but when I showed them the pictures, they were like, all right, next time you can do it. So. So this is with a 15 millimeter again in the housing, lots of depth of field. Um, and people always say, well, how do you prevent the water drops? Yeah, it's very hard. I give it a good clean when I'm down there. Somehow it runs off fairly quickly. I don't mind the effect of the drops. It's kind of interesting. Um, and then I put together a little a movie about this event. And so this is how they start. They all anchor. And then they pull up like a Le Mans start. This is a GoPro on the bow. And then this is with an XF300 following close and going across the bow. And beautiful color down there. You know, it's 25 degrees in New York City, and it's sort of 80 degrees in the Bahamas. I know where I'd rather be working. Here the GoPro is at the end of the boom. Now watch the guys get flipped off the boat here, boof, in the water. And this is also close to disaster. This boat got so close to sinking. Wow. Yeah. And so these are obviously the locals, and they're the specialists, and they've done it all, and they know exactly who's doing what. And it's wonderful to sit there and listen to their commentary. And here is a masthead shot with a 5D Mark II. Uh, with a remote and I'd be following around and just click, click, click. People always say to me, oh, were you up there? I'm like, yeah, do you think my 220 pounds could handle that? The boat would be upside down. So, and again, in the water. And it works when the water is clear. You know, this is crystal clear water uh, in Grenada and we're probably about a mile offshore. So it's just perfect for doing this kind of thing. You think it's, it's, it sounded like it gave a good click, so. Excellent, there we go. Because I have one or two there, it's got some. Thank you. And here I am on the left in the white slam shirt with my camera in one end, holding on for dear life as they're towing the sailboat away. But you see the angle on the right, the, the type of stuff that I'm getting. I put a pair of fins on, the water's warm, it's 75 degrees, so you can swim all day. And the first time I did this a few years ago, the guys were really laughing at me and saying, you're nuts. But once they started seeing what I was getting, I was kind of cool. So here's a capsize situation, and the guys are obviously trying to get the sails down to get the boat towed back. And again, as soon as they capsize, I'd go like a beeline with a powerboat to get there before they get it all sorted out, and, and I'd jump in the water. And this is also in Grenada, uh, way down in the Caribbean chain, and a bunch of young kids sailing, and it's great, because I'd say to them, you guys, you got to act for me, it's Hollywood, you know, so we're, we get some action. And this is how Patagonia used the, <laughs> the image. Yeah. And they just so welcomed me there. I've been going there for 10 years shooting this event and you really get a good handle on on how to do it and work with the people and you know you're on the beach with all the locals you know it's just great so this is a a GoPro camera in the masthead yeah you saw the guy trying to catch up with the boat and um, you'll see that doesn't all go so smoothly for this team of youngsters a um, lot of breeze it was a very windy event and as you see here I slowed it down in editing, and here the rig goes down, and it's all over. Watch the guy in the front as he just bails out. He's like, I'm out of here. <laughs> and so here the boat capsizes, the rig goes down, and um, you can see nice clear water. So this, this writes to an SD card, a Lexar SD card. And what happened here was that on the tow back, 
the camera was still on the masthead. I couldn't get to it. And, but they dragged the camera across the bottom of the ocean. So it's supposed to be waterproof, but what camera can handle that? So the whole thing got wet, got mm -hmm. trashed. I couldn't retrieve the information. I sent it to Lexar. And literally a month ago, I got the information back. I, I shot this two years ago. And so they said, we are going to figure out how to get the information back. And that was, that came, so that had been in the water for four hours, that card. So, and I've had that before with Lexar where I've fallen in the water with a card and that when we re retrieved the information. So now I go to Miami and, and do a, a series of boats called a Star Class. Uh, they're just beautiful boats. I was shooting down there with a mate a couple of years ago on a chase boat. And I was just loving this very white monochromatic imagery. And he said to me, how boring, there's no colors. And I just thought to myself, he is just not seeing it, you know? And uh, I've had a blast with this class. It's been really beautiful shooting. Uh, long lens, freeze the action, probably a shutter speed of about 1500 and an f-stop of about sort of f5.6 or maybe even eight. And it's all about the timing. People say to me, oh, you must put it on continuous high. Never, ever shoot on continuous high. I go click, 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 and I very systematically frame the shot, wait for it. You can time it. The bow comes up. The bow, it's, so I like to shoot very uh, specifically and accurately like this. Here's a little color. My mate would have been more excited about this lot. This is in Miami, February. Nice time to be in Florida. This was taken with the 500 I was telling you guys about um, earlier. This was shot this summer, I think in August, and uh, hand holding a 500 at the mark as the boats were coming up to me. Down in Key West. Big waves, it's wet, it's bumpy, it's hard on the gear. So the way that I, I have my gear out there is in a big box. Um, either a Pelican or different brands. And this way I can close the lid when I'm running from one mark to the next. And when I get to the mark, I open the box. So the, the bottom lens is the 500, then the 300, then the 70 to 200. Then I'll have a, a 28 and a 16 to 35. And that's sort of my arsenal with three bodies. And that's the way I'm able to chop and change quickly without having to take bodies and you know, lenses apart back at Key West. Miami. Yeah. So this is my Bible, the histogram. And um, obviously, this is a pretty perfect histogram right here. But I just wanted to say to you guys, you know, this is something that is really well worth looking into and using. Um, you know, it's like going with an old manual camera that doesn't have a light meter or anything. It's, um, it's great to have a means of seeing what the camera is doing or what the subject, how it is affecting. How do you read that? Here we go. How do you read this? Um, this is all the dark area. So as the arrow shows you, it's the blacks of the mountain. And then as you go into the middle, these are more the midtones. And then all the way on the right hand side is over here is the very bright area. And the brighter that that becomes, the higher this goes, and then you start to blow out. So the ideal thing to have is that you have information on both sides. And if you go to the next shot, obviously there's, you can't always have the, mo the mountain in the middle like I had with my first shot. Here, we have a lot of dark. But if we were to move this over into the middle to get the mountain in the middle, then we would be blowing out the lights or where the sunshine's coming in. And so here's the opposite, you know, where you have it all the way over to the right. So it's a matter of tr trying it, shoot, have a look, and see what's going on. And the other thing that works perfectly in this as a partner is the blinky. You know, if um, it's when you have something that blows out, for instance, in this particular scenario, all the way on the right-hand side to the right of the dog, that white water would be flashing. And what that's telling you is that it's you're losing information. There's no, there's no more definition in the file. So the histogram is divided into three sections? Just one, Just but one. it moves around. So the, when you over and under compensate the exposure, plus or minus, that mountain will move from left to right. And the whole idea is to, to not get 
too much jammed up on this side or too much jammed up on that side. If we had this mountain all the way over here, this would all be blowing out, and probably the dog as well. So um, it's, it's something that you need to practice with and, and see what's going on so that you can understand what the parameters are. I mean, this is the basic background of it. This is not a... Are you sort of thinking negative, positive, negative, positive? Um, no, I don't really think negative, positive. I don't quite understand what you mean by, by that. I mean, with a highlight in the, in, in the, the shadow area, like uh, you would think the dark area would be standing for uh, either too much light or too much shadow. Right, yeah. And you try to interpret what the... Um, the values are, yeah, exactly. And, and so very much left to right. I mean, if you have everything jammed up on this side, well, there's going to be a lot of darkness. And you always have to have some information along here. I mean, I can spend a whole workshop talking about histograms, and it is really worth it. But um, I don't have a ton of examples to show you here how it works. But it's something that if you shoot and you have a good handle on it, it won't take you very long to figure out that it's, it's, it's an easy way to get perfect exposures. Here you can see how easy it would be if this area was blown out because you've got this dark boat and this white water, how easy it would be. But with a histogram, I can see exactly where I'm at and that I'm not losing any data or, or, or you know, definition. But you get a lot of middle tones in your white. Yes. That's yeah. And that's the key with a histogram. And then with the blinky as well. Do you understand what I'm saying about yeah, the blinky? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a wonderful tool because in a case like this, if, if I were to get a little bit of flashing up in this white, it wouldn't bother me because I don't need to see what that white is white. And a lot of times with some sails, or also up here, if I was getting some flashing going on up here, it wouldn't w bother me at all because I want to be able to keep, keep the definition down here because you know if this is flashing, then this is going to be correct. If I stop the flashing here, this is going to get too dark and it'll get black and muddy. And here's a day that this guy's day is not going so right. So any case. I think the guy on the leeward side or way down here had wished he joined the chess club for that day, you know, so. It's always, you know, when flying the helicopter, boy, the colors on the screen are so much nicer than, than here, so <laughs> I'll take that. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's always about the composition, and people will say to me, oh, can you tell me a little bit more about how to compose a picture? It's kind of like saying to a singer, well, how do you get that beautiful tone? You know, I mean, it's, 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 you look and you see how it works. And I saw the red and the yellow spinnaker sailing together. And I said to the pilot, let's position here. And we'd keep moving sideways with them. And the watercolor was working. And you know, you'd think they were two white spinnakers that people had photoshopped. But no, that's the way that it really was. Here's just a couple of examples of how the work gets used. I'm a Canon Explorer of Light. And so they use my pictures for the ads. And it's a wonderful relationship working with a good company like that, uh, trying new gear and um, you know, lecturing, like here, where I do Canon lectures, Lexar lectures. Um, it's, a, it's a good setup. And Sailing World's a big sailing magazine. I'm sure you read it. But um, I do a lot of work for those guys. Little action on the water. Now, that was an overcast day, right? This? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there was some sun coming through. But it's very hazy. You know in the summertime how it goes. You get that, we call it a smoky southwester, when you get a lot of humidity in the air. And I kind of like it because it's not that harsh, crisp. You know when you get a northerly breeze here and it's really contrasty. The blue is that hard blue in the sky and you, there's nothing in between. On these sort of smoky days, I love it. And then if you go later in the day, this is middle of the day. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. But if you come at 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock, this light is magic because it's so soft and you get that little golden color to everything. And they use my pictures for everything. My signature even on the side of the bus. Uh, we were going and doing a skiing trip on, in Montreal, and I had my nephew from South Africa with me. And uh, he, he couldn't believe it. He taps me on the shoulder. He says, check it out. Your signature's just <laughs> passing us now. This is the bus that came by us. We do a lot with stock. Stock photography is, a, is probably half our income. And so I'm presented by, represented by Corbis, and then a smaller agency in England. And then the gal that runs my business, who's been with me for 12 years, sells stock. That is her job. And she talks to the magazines, to you know, ad agencies here in New York. 
and all over. And because we have such a unique subject, and I've been doing it for 25 years, um, people know we're there. And if you go to Google and you punch in sailing photography, we come up number one. And so we get a lot of calls from some art buyers sitting in New York on the 45th floor who says, you know, what do you have for me? And if we don't have it in stock, I sometimes can talk them into doing an assignment. Um, here's again a little bit of a timing shot from the air with a 300 millimeter lens. Um, just trying to get them as they're taking the sail down. Now as these guys are sorting out a problem on the boat, the four of them working their way, this guy on the, on the shore is just creating his own interesting, um, who knows, hopefully that'll work out for him. But. I didn't even see the wedding couple on the side until I got the pictures back. It's like, oh my, oh well, there we are. I love shooting low on the power boat. This was a fairly big swell kind of day, so I had a lot of times when the swell would come between me and the boat. And shooting with a longer lens, obviously you get this sort of shallow depth of field look. This is in Antigua. And the back of the guy, the guy shouting at the back is, I don't know if he's saying hello or he's saying, get the hell out of the way. Yeah. And I know him, and later on, I, we had a good laugh about it, you know. But I always try and get close. It's like all the eyes are pointing in that one direction, you know, like At me. Yeah. Yeah. Get out of the way. Exactly. And what I do is the boat will be coming down like this, and I'll position my boat like this. So that all we just got to do is slowly move away. But it's nice to get this perspective. But, you know, you've got to be a little, you know, you've got to hang in there and realize you may get some shouting. And, you know, you saw my name on my boat. Beforehand, it's on assignment. The lettering is pretty big. So... I've got to be a little careful. No yeah, there's no escape. They know who it is, and they know where to find me. Uh, this was the America's Cup series we had in, in Narragansett Bay this past summer. Uh, very exciting stuff. These catamarans sail very fast, and uh, a nice perspective from the air looking straight down the mast. And I will show you some other pictures. This is not all going to be about sailboat racing. Um, we have other pictures to show you as well. Again, with a long lens to position, to exactly get the guy between the mast and the sail. Takes a little talking to the pilot, you know, forward, back, slow down a bit. And so this was that series in Newport, where I had the helicopter, and then I went on one of the boats that the officials use. And I was able to shoot with a 16 to 35 millimeter lens sitting on the bow and I just put the GoPro up behind me, and so you get a nice feel of the movement and the action as these guys come very close to us. I took a picture of it, though. When it, yeah, <laughs> it was pretty wild. So this guy was very close to us as he zipped along. The video that you see here is GoPro behind me, mounted on the boat, and I switch it on and I let it run. Yeah. And so this is all taken with a DS Mark III, the stills, with a 16 to 35 millimeter lens. And this is all in new. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, yeah. GoPro is good. You know, I, I really use the GoPro mostly to illustrate my lectures and my talks, a little bit for clients. Um, but it's so great to show people of what, what it's like and, and, and what my work is all about. Yeah, exactly. So here, the big and the small, these are much bigger boats. Um, these boats are sort of in that $20 million range, $15 million. And he is just barreling through two little guys. But he has to give way because the big boat gives way. Um, and I've been following the, that fleet for quite a while, doing some racing with them. Um, here is an even bigger boat. I hate to guess what the, the money on this boat is. Must be in that sort of, you know, 80, 90, 100 million dollar boat, I would imagine. Is that Philbin? Yeah. 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 It's called Maltese Falcon. Oh, she's trucking along at a good 15 knots there, I would imagine. And this is, you want to keep the outboard going here. This is not a place where, you know, the driver says to you, we have a problem because you'd be diving over this. It also sails and it also uses diesel. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. But she's sailing here. This is a regatta. This is the same boat. So now you see the rigs. Very interesting design. And these, these masts, they rotate. 
So the whole sail rotates to adjust for the wind direction. And um, very, very clever guy. He, he, he so the sails are stationary, and it's the beam that's uh, rotating. C correct. The whole, the wishbone, everything moves mm -hmm. like that. And the sails don't change shape or anything. They just, and they rotate in the mast. The mast is down below in the boat, and there's big hydraulic rams down there that turn. Obviously, the guy has so much money that he could you know, experiment with this type of stuff. So these are two boats. That's the same boat again on the right-hand side, down off St. Martin, and uh, a regular sailboat on the left. And I just sort of threw in a little rock work there to make it interesting. How, does, how do they get rid of the sails? Yeah. They end up rolling them into the, um, into the what they call them. Th there's a big, uh, like a pipe in there. And so it ro like a curtain, you know, it just rolls it up. Like an awning, exactly. Did you say you put the rocks in? No, I did, <laughs> but but I moved my boat and moved them in. I don't do Photoshop work like that. I, I just, I, my wording wasn't very good there. Good catch. So here I'm at about 160 feet um, in a small little chair, hanging from a rope, very high up. And a 15 millimeter lens. And obviously, how do you not get your feet in a picture like that? Because so what I end up doing is I go up the mast in this sort of little strap around me with a rope. And then if this is the mast, then I put both feet up against the mast like that, push myself away, grab the camera, and shoot from here. Click, click, click. And I have a look. Oh, too much of that. Click, click, click. And that's how I get it. Because if, you, if you're sitting against the mast like this, your feet are there. So my feet would be in all the pictures. So it's a little experimenting and trying these things over the years. I've figured out how to get them. Another aerial of one of these big boats, and who on earth would ever have purple sails? But I guess if you have money, you can do what you like. But look at the color of the water. It's, this is down in St. Bart's, near St. Martin, down in the islands. And then we go to England, shoot these large sailboats. These are 140 foot. And we had a, a week of racing down there last summer uh, off the south coast of, of England. And uh, it was just rainy and windy all the time. But it made for great imagery. It was really exciting. And what percentage did you crop? Quite a lot. Um, this particular shot is cropped a little bit. But some shots I'll go in half, you know, literally go right in. It does maintain the resolution. And, it's, and that's why it is so worth having a good sensor on a full frame camera with expensive glass because then you can really have the liberty of cropping. And sometimes I'll be shooting, and I think to myself, I know exactly how I'm going to crop this later on. You know, make it panoramic, or slice it down, or make it square, or whatever. That, and, and it'll be funny, if I'm a couple days later, I'm on the computer, I, that comes back to me. I'm like, bing, that's what I thought. And then you crop it like that. And I'll make three or four versions of that same picture with different crops. Like if you want an ideal shot, and you know, uh you don't want it to be vertical, but you take it vertical because you want to get the whole beam without right. so much distortion. And yeah. you know the other half is more or less, you don't really You don't it. need it. Yeah. And you still maintain all the resolution? Definitely. Up and hard. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite remarkable how you can crop in. And for some of my calendar shots, which are printed you know, in CMYK this big, I've cropped right in. And you can still count the, the drops of water coming off the sail. So um, it all works. Again, following somebody fairly closely. And this was another situation where I had to hold on to the boat with one hand and shoot with a 70 to 200 with the other hand, holding it with one hand and trying to shoot this. And so obviously I used a fairly fast shutter speed. Um, but this was when the 70 to 200 was new. And that was their Mark II with better image sta stabilizing. And obviously it works. But when you're following a boat like this, th my power boat is pounding into the same waves all the time. So it makes for a challenging time. And here's a shot that I cropped right into. This was a major crop to get this particular angle. And I mean, the full shot is nice as well, but I just preferred this particular angle, or crop, I should say. Lots of power, lots of breeze, lots of money. Look at the guys on the back of the boat. They're just holding on for dear life there. <laughs> Looks like a washing machine. Is that Ranger? This is Ranger, exactly. So these boats were used in the 30s for the America's Cup here, off Sandy Hook, off New York. And then the war came, and it all sort of withered away. And there's a huge 
rebuild of these boats of the fleet. They've got about seven of them out there now, four or five racing, and it's, it's coming back. But they raced them with 30 guys, and the budget for these boats must be in the sort of five to, I would imagine, five million dollars a year to run a program like this. And that's just what he does for fun, you know, so. And that's how the shot is used. And this was in England this past summer. This is very much the high, the top end of sailing in the way of boats and money and people. And it's, it's quite um, sort of daunting. It's quite, you, know, you meet these people and you realize, you know, you're just nothing compared to what these guys have done and they've built up in their empire of business. They have a Learjet parked at the closest airport and they have a house in the south of France and it's, it's pretty remarkable stuff. And a lot of them are great people, you know. You get to know them, you sail with them. Here I sailed with a boat like that from Newport to Bermuda. Uh, early in the morning, well before sunrise, on a tripod, a long exposure of about 10 seconds. And uh, you can see now how we have the silky water all the way, you know, because I just left it open so long that everything became, you know, the motion was there. That's the moon up top, a little squiggle. And then look at the, you can see how long my exposure was that the guy was turning the steering wheel at the spokes completely blurred. But I, I got up, this was probably, I would say, a good half an hour before sunrise. Because I wanted to get that effect. I wanted to have the long shutter speed, nice soft color. I want to see the lights down below. And this is the guys, this is what that boat looks like down below. Very stripped out. It's a racing boat. The guys eat fr freeze dried food, so it's a little pouch. You pour boiling water in it. There's no champagne and caviar here, you know. So that's the same, that those big 140-foot sailboats, that's me in the white shirt. I um, just wanted to show you a little bit about what it's like to be on board. Um, I had my camera in a waterproof bag this time with a little flash on top. And um, this is the sort of imagery that you get. You know, the waves splash right in you, in, in your face. You gotta hold on, though. When you're photographing, you ever get pushed over by the wave? I've never been pushed over by the wave. By the wave, I have once gone overboard because a piece of safety gear failed on the boat and luckily it was inshore and the water was warm and it was August in Narragansett Bay and I swam for probably seven or eight minutes and they came to pick me up but the camera was toast but the little the little poles on the side of the sailboat one of those broke and I was sitting down leaning against it with my shoulder not like I I jumped right into it and I went in you know so yeah there's risks involved same boat, looking back, now you can see how the fill flash is doing its thing. It's the middle of the day, the light's, light's very harsh, so it's nice to have a little fill. This is in the trenches with the guys working on the foredeck. Again, slow shutter speed. Same scenario as we talked about earlier. The boat in the far way in the background is sharp, but look at the water right here. Even his foot is blurry because he's so close. And again, I'm probably at about a 30th or a 15th of a second with a 16 to 35. And the only way for me to figure these things out is to try it and just to go ridiculously slow. And then sometimes you think it'll never work and you get it on the computer and you're like, oh my goodness, it's perfect. So then you know for the next time that you know a 10th or a 15th works, whereas beforehand you probably would never have tried it. I'm a huge one for experimenting and trying new stuff, masthead mount or a little GoPro here and to get something that the other guys don't have. There's a lot of guys shooting sailing. You've got to be different to get the assignments. This is an ad campaign for a sailboat builder, uh, J, J Boats, there in Rhode Island. And this was an aerial shot. We got all the models set up, the girls in white, the guys in red, two boats together. Lots of communication with them and the pilot to get it all lined up. And then this is what happens. They, the magazines pick it up, and then they do a whole ad campaign with it. This is also an ad shoot for this particular builder up in Maine. And here I was with a waterproof housing on a small rubber boat leaning over the front. And I had the camera literally six inches above the water. And we were going parallel with the boat. So you get a little bit of movement, not really silky, but you can see the water drops on the, on the lens itself, but it's a waterproof camera casing, so it doesn't matter. Again, I wanted to get a different perspective. I wanted to get close and low. Same little boat, but now 
a different situation, a different shot with a huge sailboat in the background. Again, slow shutter speed. And here I use a little piece of gear called the pod. It's about this big, that high, and it's just a miniature bean bag. And what it has is a quarter by 20 thread underneath, so you screw it into the bottom of the camera, and you're able to put that little bag or the camera down on deck or on a wall or on wherever you're working. It's the perfect little sort of, not really a tripod, but I love using it. So here I'm, I've got about a two second exposure. I plonk it down and I fire and I fire and I look and I fire and I check my histogram and not all of them are sharp, but look at the, the, the motion in the water that you get from such a nice long shutter speed and lots of depth of field. I was probably at f16, so I'm getting everything sharp. This was a very successful ad campaign that, uh, for a large Dutch boat builder. And this was picked up by a couple of magazines, which was an interesting crop. And then Canon ended up using it. So this is a, a, you know, a, an assignment that I did in the Bahamas. And this is very much a cruising story about a nice destination. And this was flying there. I just thought, wow, it looks so beautiful coming over from Miami uh, and looking at the islands the way the current from the Atlantic sweeps through. Um, and then here we are uh, out there cruising with my two boys. I found a boat at a boat show and talked to the builder and said, let me do some stuff with this boat, and I will show you. Um, and so we ended up getting a, a great bunch of pictures. Um, we saw all kinds of wildlife. I love taking my little backpack with camera gear and going, going ashore and shooting this type of stuff. We found an old wrecked drug runner. Uh, my little guy here, who at that point, he was probably about 11 or 12. They thought they were in the middle of a James Bond movie, you know. And so it was very basic sailing. This was not a $10 million boat. This is probably about a $25,000 you know, plywood catamaran. So if you want to have a shower, this is where you, you have the shower. And um, you know, the, the cooking wasn't that fancy either. We had a little grill on the back, and we'd have sausages and potatoes most, most dinners with an orange for dessert. But um, it was just a remarkable time, the three of us. And so it was picked up by several magazines here and worldwide in, in France, in Holland, in, in England. They all ran the story. Again, in the water, half in, half out, 15 millimeter lens, lots of depth of field, crystal clear water. Got to have the clear water to make it work. And so they picked it up as a cover. You can see I use the 15 quite a bit. And I really accentuate the fisheye angle here by grabbing the camera and just holding it down that I just get the horizon in the top of the frame. And uh, you can see my shadow on the rock on the right-hand side there, and then the two gals in the middle of the frame. Um, it was just beautiful cruising. This is in Baja in Mexico. Off to Belize. I always take my waterproof camera with me, the housing. And so this makes for interesting imagery. With the turtles. This is down in the, uh, in the Grenadines, down in the Caribbean. And this is all snorkeling, so it's hard work. You know, you've got to swim with these guys, and they're at 10 or 12 or 15 feet down. So you take a good breath, go down, take some still pictures. And I was also doing video at this point. Uh, so with video, it's even harder, because you've got to hold the shot for a while, you know? You come up, and you think you're going to burst, because you need air, you know? It's just, that was the boat that we were on down there. This is the Elbow Key Lighthouse in Hopetown in the Abacos in the Bahamas. And again, just great. I went and met this guy in the afternoon and said, can I come back when you light the lantern? And this is a kerosene lantern. I mean, we're in 2012, and this gentleman still lights the kerosene light with a match. And he has to crank it up by hand so that it rotates. And this was probably built at the turn of the century, and it's still working. And it probably has a, a range of about 12 miles, this lighthouse. So it was fun to go. And this was one of my very first digital photo shoots, um, I think probably about 12 years ago now, with a 1DS. And um, just the fact that I didn't have to put faster film in and I could hand hold it and still capture the shot. And again, taking into account the ambient light outside. I waited until the light was just perfect, just like my interior shots, that they would balance out nicely. 
handheld from the dinghy. I had climbed up this mountain and obviously at sunset and then as it got darker, the, the boat came to pick me up and this was handheld shooting the boat with a moon coming up behind it. Cuba. It was a wonderful trip to, go next, to see the locals there, how they, no outboards there, it's all by sail. Are you messing with the clarity on that at all? The clarity in Lightroom? Uh, or I was thinking Photoshop. Um, all my imagery goes through, this happens to be a, a, a film file, but um, the other one, the Cuban. The Cuban was also a slide with a scan from so a Chrome. You scan it, you can yeah. Um, I, I don't really, you know, now I, I must answer your question in a Lightroom situation. And I do a little bit of clarity, but I really do very little to my images. I try and shoot them spot on, straight in the camera. And I just got uh, the 1DX about a month ago. And every time you get a new camera, it gets better and better in that it needs less and less post-production tweaking. When I first got the 1DS in 2000 and whatever it was, I can't remember how, how long ago, but I was quite disappointed with the, the, the picture quality because it was just the color wasn't right and you had to really tweak it to get it right, whereas now it's just so much better. This was an assignment I did in Vanuatu, which is a small group of islands in the South Pacific. And uh, this was our final drop off after having traveled for two days from um, New York. And the guy opened the door and he threw all the bags out and said, see you, you're on your own, you know, and fired up the plane. And, and we were off on our, this was a travel and leisure assignment. And here I had my, my flash on a wire. So it came from the, the shoe of the flash to the hot shoe of the camera. It's a six foot wire. And I just held it there and I sort of fired away with one hand with my 20, 24 to 70. And uh, it's just nice to get a little different light. You can imagine with no flash, it would have been a dead shot. Dinner. This is in French Polynesia. And again, no filters, no tweaking. This is actually um, a chrome, a slide that was just scanned and put straight into the slideshow. But people had told me about this place and said, you must go and shoot here because it's beautiful. So we ended up spending six hours hiking up this mountain to go and see the active volcano. <laughs> and um, the only way you could really look is to be held like that and look over the side. And you really couldn't see much. But I was a little taller than him. And with a camera, I did the same thing. And it was a film camera in those days. So you had no idea what was going on. But this is what the camera was seeing. You know, so a long way down in the bowels of the earth. So this was all a story about cruising and sailing in this area on a large charter boat and showing the experience. Do you have to do any liveaboards? Do, do, liveaboard? do, do I do a liveaboard yeah. stories about people like that? Yes. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of people who I'll spend time with and go and document their life on the boat. So this is Manemsha in Maine. I was doing a story here for a magazine called Power and Motor Yacht. And, uh, we had run out from Portland, Maine, to this place, and just beautiful. Maine is so nice in July and August. <laughs> Same area, just a different angle. I shoot everything in RAW, and I convert everything in Lightroom. And uh, what a wonderful way to work in that software program. I'm using a polarizer here, just to accentuate the sky a little bit. in Thailand. Here's another interesting shot, obviously a very strong crop, um, where the salmon were moving from left to right. I had the camera in a housing. And um, it was just, it was so cool to see the fish underwater and see the fishermen above the surface. And so th there he had the fish on the line. And I waited until the fish tired a little bit. Then I walked in. And it's quite shallow. It's probably only about two feet deep. But the fish literally came right up to the camera and swam by a couple times and, uh, before he slowed right down. And we took him out and was put in the pot for dinner that night.
here, 15 millimeter, looking down into the water of these dolphins in New Zealand. And this is all the way down in Patagonia on the, the south end of Chile before you get to Cape Horn. I spent um, a month with this boat documenting their travels. And I've done a fair bit of work since that, since that time with somebody else. Um, you go on board as a crew member and you, you, take, you make film, you make pictures. It's a, it's a neat way of going out there and seeing what's going on. My boots, my orange boots. And here I really wanted to have the boots in the picture to give it perspective, to show how high it is and to show the ice. This was way up north in the Arctic. Uh, we were probably at about 80 degrees north here. Polar bear country. Same neck of the woods. Nobody's up there. I enjoy that type of scenery. I think it's beautiful being there. Very quiet. So this is an area called Spitsbergen. And it's uh, an area that Norway takes care of. <coughs> and so now we end up going to another island off South America <coughs> called South Georgia. And uh, that was about a four or five day sail in these conditions to get to the island. In the background, you see the large wandering albatross. 11 foot wingspan. And here I would sit on the back of the sailboat. This was a 90 foot sailboat, so a decent sized boat. And I'd sit on the back deck, and this bird would just continuously keep circling, waiting for us to put the scraps of food over the side so that he could have something to eat. But um, big. The ever-present danger of icebergs down there. We're at 55 degrees south, just to give you a little idea of how far south we were. Lots of hiking. I had a 40-pound 40, 40 backpack. So uh, I came back pretty fit from that trip. I was there for five weeks. Where are those, where are those two white lines? The, the lines that you see coming off the boat yeah. are, because there's so much seaweed on the bottom, you cannot use an anchor. So you have to tie the boat up with ropes going to the shore. And it's actually a very good, secure way of doing it, because if it blows, you know, your ropes are good and they're solid. And we put them with chains around the rocks and then to the rope, and the rope floats. floats. It's polypropylene. So. So there's three, th three ropes there, two on the back and one on the front. Same kind of thing here. You can see the rope off the bow. But look at it blowing and the icebergs in the background. I always had a 300 millimeter lens with me in my pack so that I could shoot nice and close of the wildlife and the birds and not harass them. Um, obviously, a 200 probably would have worked. Uh, but I had my 300, and so this is the type of imagery you get, nice and sharp. We had two small runabouts, and um, it was always nice to put the other one in the picture to give it a little perspective. So this is all down in South Georgia. So if you envision the bottom of South America and the bottom of Africa, about halfway between, that's where this island is. It's 200 miles long by about 30 miles wide. So it's fairly small. There's about six people living there. So, And then thousands and thousands of penguins. It was very noisy and it was very smelly. <laughs> and these are the smaller chinstrap penguins. Late in the day, nice light. I noticed this iceberg on the distance uh, on the horizon. And as we were motoring towards this bay for the night, I said to the owner, let's make a little turn and have a look. And this is what we were getting. Elephant seal. You, you can see the movement under his nose of the sand grains as he's breathing out. He was keeping a good eye on me. I didn't want to get it, go any closer. But that was with a 300 again. Here I'd spent the whole day ashore. It was cold. It was about 35 degrees, very damp and windy. And um, the last 45 minutes of the day, we had sunshine. 
and these birds suddenly started to do their courtship dance. And it's great, the, the, the clacking of the beaks and the braying, it sounds like a donkey the way that they, it's just really cool. And I ended up starting to shoot this with a 7200, but by the time that he had got close enough to this good looking gal, um, I had to switch to the 28 to 70, the 24 to 70, and the tip of his wing was actually touching me, so. He didn't care that I was there. He had other things on his mind. So I do workshops. And this is a boat that we charter in Newport Harbor. And we, we leave uh, at about 3 in the afternoon and shoot until sunset. So we put in about a good four hours. of, And we go and find sailboats, lighthouses, bridges. And it's a great way to go out and spend some time. I normally don't take more than 12 or 13 people. And um, I do a lot of teaching and talking to people as we go along. Um, this is a little video that I put together. Again, the GoPro on the bow. And it gives you a little idea of, of what we do. And it's people of all walks, and you know, there are some are mostly amateurs, the occasional professional. And we do about three or four of these each summer. And lots of hand on teaching. I did a workshop in San Francisco during the America's Cup in uh, July. And uh, we obviously had a lot of gear from Canon there, lenses that everybody could try, tripods. And we had a nice group of people. Got some, uh, some good action there. So it's all about putting people in the right place and helping them capturing the image, talking about histograms and shutter speed and ISO settings and camera settings and so on. So this is all looking into San Francisco Bay with Alcatraz in the background. And we're on a big pier. And these boats were coming right up to us and turning right there. This was in Newport. Again, a long shutter speed of probably about five seconds at maybe f11. And um, you can see the flags got a little mo movement in them. Again, making sure that the light outside starts to balance out with the lighting on the street. This is another part of my business that is quite important and has grown nicely over the years, a gallery. And um, I don't know if you people ever come to Newport, but it's, uh, this is what it looks like inside. We print on canvas. We print on aluminum. We print on plexi. We have all different types of products. We have greeting cards. And it all revolves around my sailing photography. And then we do sh shows with other artists. This was a show I did uh, also in Rhode Island with a bunch, uh, with a potter. And then we've done posters. And this is all the work that sells in the gallery. And what we've done is we've selected a bunch of um, limited edition prints. And we sign them all and we number them. And um, it's, it's, it's actually remarkable how much stuff we sell. When we started the gallery, I thought, well, let's give it a go and see if our, our work will, will, will sell. People, do they want to hang it on the wall? And it works. And how many times people haven't said to me, well, this is done in Photoshop. I can do that, too. Um, there's no Photoshop here. This is just the way it was. Nice reflection, late light. And like I said, this is all imagery we sell in the gallery. These are very popular prints. If you see this on canvas or on a rag paper, um, the Hawaiian water just pops. Also a very popular shot of one of the beaches in Rhode Island. bridge in Newport. This is a lifeguard chair on a beach. And I was coming back from another assignment, and I suddenly noticed this going on with the, the tractor marks where they rake the beach. And I said to the pilot, let's take a little swing here and have a look. And he was shaking his head, saying, what do you see here? You know, But um, that's what we captured that morning just after sunrise. 
some nasty weather moving in. A, a weekend regatta on Narragansett Bay. And again, untouched by Photoshop or whatever, that's the way it is. You know, within half an hour, it was blowing like stink and raining, and it was pretty miserable. This was, I've put a couple of shots in here from Sandy. Um, and this was the night before Sandy hit. And this is at Beaver Tail uh, on one of the islands in Narragansett Bay, looking south and handheld here with the 1DX. And had the ISO set at 10,000. Um, and I wanted to catch the beam because there was so much <coughs> moisture in the air that the, the, the beam was beautifully caught in the, almost like a fog. Yeah. And this is uh, at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, when we got hammered. And obviously, so did New York and New Jersey. Um, we didn't get it as badly as you guys did here. But you can see the cars were shut down. This road was shut down probably 20 minutes later. And it was all water, this road. You couldn't even drive over it. And this is looking towards Newport from Jamestown. And here, it's probably blowing about 65 or 75 knots. So you know, probably 70 miles an hour. And those guys couldn't get their boats out because they just ran out of time. There wasn't enough time to get all the boats out. And very hard shooting into the breeze like this because the water is just so wet. So you're continuously wiping down the front element. And this is downtown Newport, the shopping area of Bowen's Wharf. And um, the water had already started to drop here. But it's a very familiar scene to a lot of us. Again, all shot with a 1DX. This is probably 5,000 ISO in that sort of range. So that's the end of my presentation. And um, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web 